Hello, I am here to review both the Hyperkin Cadet Premium USB controller and the Evo Retro NES controller. I bought the Hyperkin controller on Amazon Canada on August 8, 2022 for 25 Canadian dollars plus tax. And I bought the Evo Retro controller as part of a five controller bundle for 55 Canadian dollars plus tax. This is not a sponsored video and I am here to give my honest opinion. I apologize for opening the Hyperkin controller. When properly assembled, the D-pad and buttons protrude out of the controllers as expected, but I don't have the original board anymore, so I am unable to show it. It won't affect the verdict because I am basing this off my experiences with it when it was functional, but it will affect my ability to demonstrate. Still, not all is lost, as I will show you the insides later. In order to figure out who this controller is for, we first have to look at the design. Both controllers draw inspiration from the original Nintendo Entertainment System controller in the look, color, size, and layout. If that interests you, then it will be an advantage when considering whether to buy. As someone who started my gaming journey in 1989 with the original Nintendo Entertainment System, I appreciate the effort to replicate the look and feel. The Hyperkin adds extra touches to the design so that it isn't only a direct imitation. Two of the corners are bezeled off, and the designs near the start and select buttons are slightly different. The back also has a slight bulge where the fingers grip the controllers in order to help with the ergonomics. I like the design of the Hyperkin because I think the design changes are subtle, but well thought out to give a unique appearance. Many of these cheap mass-produced Chinese retro controllers all look the same, and it's hard to tell where the controller came from, but with a unique design and logo, you can identify a Hyperkin controller very quickly. That being said, I also like the original look of the Evo retro controller for nostalgic purposes. It's really your personal preference. Because the Hyperkin is disassembled, I cannot provide a fair visual comparison in this video, and I apologize. The output for both of these controllers are USB. This means it isn't wireless, and it won't work with the socket of the original Nintendo Entertainment System. These controllers are primarily used for Windows PC gaming and can be compatible with Mac, Android, and Linux. The primary use will likely be retro emulation or playing some very simple computer games. The controllers are fairly standard to set up in RetroArch. They are plug and play on Windows because they don't need any additional drivers. For Android, the controllers seem to work with navigating the home screen on my Google Pixel 7, but RetroArch on Android has a hard time recognizing the device, so compatibility may vary. The four-button layout matches many retro systems, including the Nintendo Entertainment System, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Sega Master System, Game Gear, and the Neo Geo Pocket. I believe that the two action button layout might be the most important feature to justify a purchase. There aren't many choices for controllers with only two action buttons because it is an extremely niche market. The regular Xbox Series X controller can play every single game these controllers can play and more. The only reason you should choose these controllers is because you already have a primary controller and you want something that looks and feels like a retro controller that has two action buttons. If not, you can skip this purchase. 
I personally refused to get a retro style controller with four face buttons, so I got myself these controllers. Let's talk about the build quality. The good news is that the outer shell seems to be made of decent material. It feels smooth and hard, and also thick enough to protect the controller from snapping into half. If you put pressure on the ends of the controller, such as when stepping on it, the controller is not going to bend or break in half. However, both the input detection and the durability of the wire or electronics leave something to be desired. Both of these controllers broke on me just months after use. The Hyperkin controller was rejected by the computer as an unknown device just two months after use. I have multiple computers, so if all of the computers display the same error, chances are it's the controller that is at fault. The Evo Retro Controller also broke five months after purchase, when it started to randomly disconnect and reconnect during play. But I was able to open it and fix it by cutting out the faulty part of the wire and connecting the good parts. It worked fine again for another five months, but then it started disconnecting again and I had to open it again and apply the same fix. Because of me cutting the wire twice, the wire is now shorter than when I first got it. But at least it still works. I can't say the same about the Hyperkin, where I finally decided to throw away the internal parts after spending too much time troubleshooting. I kept the outer shell and buttons to use as spare parts. I think the wire used for those retro controllers are less durable than those of the original NES controller. The wire quality is probably similar to some other common wires nowadays that are prone to failure. I've discarded many charging and data transfer cables in the last 10 years, so I know these wire problems are not only unique to retro controllers. I think the reason why the wire gets damaged so fast is because how it is attached to the controller. If you open the Hyperkin shell, you would see some of the twists and turns where the wire has to snake around those pillars so that it is secure and doesn't move when tugged. Having to make quick short bends will hurt the wire, and it would be even worse if there was any force pulling the wire. This was why, when I repaired the Evo Retro Controller, that was the part I cut out to fix the problem. If you're planning to get these controllers, you have to be absolutely gentle with the wire and make sure you never pull it or wrap the wire around the controllers. On the other hand, I used to be extremely rough with my old Nintendo controllers and they never broke. It seems like Nintendo controllers could withstand a hurricane, but a puff from the big bad wolf will blow these controllers down. Theoretically, you could bypass the wire issue if you bought a wireless controller, but then you'll have to deal with the new issue, such as latency, battery life, and increased costs. The cheapest wireless controllers are more expensive than the cheapest wired controllers. If these controllers are fragile, do they at least perform well? Let's start with the Hyperkin. The Hyperkin comes out of the box with a defective D-pad. If you press a direction, it only has less than a 90% chance to register the input. And if you tapped in the same direction repeatedly, its rate becomes even worse. I suspect that quality assurance pressed the directions once to check if they worked, and they did, but they didn't try double taps. After contacting the warranty department, they told me that since I bought the controller in Canada, there was no warranty, but I could ship the controller back to Amazon with the original package for a full refund. Sadly, I had disposed of the packaging, so I decided to fix the problem myself. I opened the controller and found out if I loosen two screws a bit by half a turn, it fixes the D-pad. When the D-pad works, it works pretty well, but it still does not measure up to the modern first-party D-pads. At least the Hyperkin D-pad was consistently registering inputs reliably when I fixed it. 
all of the buttons on the Hyperkin worked fine. After I fixed the D-pad, the controller worked as I would have expected of a controller. Shame, the controller broke in two months. The great news is that the EVO Retro Controller works right out of the box. The D-pad on the EVO Retro Controller is much better than the Hyperkin out of the box, but not as good as the Hyperkin after I fixed the D-pad of the Hyperkin. The response of the buttons are fine, but the response of the direction pad is not 100% especially on the up direction. It's close to 100%, but it's not 100%. This makes it very frustrating when playing unforgiving games, because motion and response is everything. I could probably increase the responsiveness rate to 100%, but I didn't have such time. It would be interesting to swap the internals of the controller with third-party repair parts and see if this brings up the detection rate. Out of the box, these controllers are not recommended to play competitive or immersive games, but are better for forgiving games such as historic lessons for kids. If you try to play the same games on an Xbox One or any quality controller, you'll notice your gameplay improve dramatically. These controllers just don't cut it for competitive play. As for availability, Hyperkin is still on the market selling controllers. However, Evo Retro is no longer selling controllers. Not all is lost, because I believe Evo Retro is just a rebranding of a cheap, generic, widely available controller. The controller is lightly available under different names. I believe that the Mario Retro controllers in the US are the same as the Evo Retro controllers. They even have the same bundle at the same time. My hunch is that some companies are buying bulk generic retro controllers from places like Alibaba and then putting their brand on it and reselling them in North America. If you buy a similar looking controller under a different name, chances are you're getting the same thing that I am getting. I linked the Hyperkin controller for Amazon Canada in the description. The Evo retro controller is not available anymore. With cheap Chinese mass-produced retro controllers, the low-quality control make it a gamble to buy. Some controllers will work, while others won't. Let's talk about what I like and don't like about the Hyperkin. I like the look of the controller, including how it is nostalgic but also unique. I like how this controller contributes to a niche market of the 4-button controller with no triggers or analog sticks and that it stands out among the generic controllers with a clear brand name and design. I like how this controller is plug and play. I like how the controller comes with a box, and the product is visible through the box. This makes it look nice if you are displaying the box on a shelf. I like the fact that they come with a warranty. I like how the customer support department promptly answered my questions. Here is what I don't like. I don't like how the product broke on me after two months of use. I didn't like how the direction pad only had a 90% response rate out of the box, something which I expected quality control to have picked up. Yes, the warranty would have covered the product if I was in the US and as long as I didn't open the controller. But even so, I would prefer my products to be properly tested. Finally, I dislike how Hyper can put the name premium in the product name. If you put premium in the name, I expect a premium product, and I don't feel like I got a premium product. In fact, in 34 years as a gamer with at least 70 controllers purchased, this controller comes dead last in terms of how long it lasted. That's not all. It died over twice as fast as the second last place. It feels pretty bad if you are not only last among 70, but you're also not even half as good as the 69th place. Here is what I love about the EVO Retro Controller. I love the price and bundle format. For 55 Canadian dollars for five different controllers, which includes 
a USB extension cable, I got my money's worth. I like how the design stays true to the original controller. I like how it is plug and play. Here is what I don't like about the EVO retro controller. The inconsistency of the D-pad absolutely destroys any serious use for this controller in retro games. I also don't like the durability of the wire as it failed on me twice. And I don't like short-term products that encourage electronics and plastics waste. If you are looking for a cheap controller for novelty, for a collection to display on the shelf, for a few quick nostalgic games, or for a history lessons for kids, and you want to use it for emulation on the PC, the EVO Retro Controller gets the job done. However, if you're into speed running or hardcore gaming, you should stick to official first party controllers or even try higher quality third party manufacturers like Logitech, 8 Bit Do, or Razer. Finally, here are some videos of tests of the EVO Retro Controller. Sorry, I can't show you the footage of the Hyperkin controller because it is broken. Hello! So one of the games I like to use to test the controller is Legend of Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System. The reason is because it has a name input and name inputs require quite precise D-pad inputs because um, if you have any unexpected taps, it can really throw you off. The other reason is because The Legend of Zelda has four directional movement, unlike some games like Mario that only has left and right. So you're able to test up, down, left, right, as well as diagonals uh, quite nicely. So let's try to enter a name. So I'll start at K. And I want to move the cursor all the way to the A. Great. So it worked as expected. Now let's move to the right. That's fine. Let's move down. And let's move up. Let's try up and down a few more times. That looks fine. Let's go and left and right a few more times. So I don't see any problems on my end. So I think everything works as uh, it should. And uh, also note that this controller is already one and a half years old and I've repaired it two times, so it might not be exactly what you might be experiencing when you buy it, um, but at least it's quite durable. So let's try holding the button and releasing on A. Okay, let's try holding the right side and then releasing on Z. Perfect. So let's enter a name. So it looks like the name input is quite good. Uh, I would have to say that it's much better than the Hyperkin out of the box because I remember when I was entering the name on the Hyperkin, it took two minutes to enter the name link. So that's a lot better here. So let's register the name and start the game. So first we want to check for movement. So the movement looks fine. So I'm going to go from left to right, and I, I, would, I do not want to hit any up or downs, just left and right. So if I accidentally go up or down, that's a bad thing. Okay, now I'm going to try to roll from left to right, but without hitting the up and downs. That is good. Now let's try the same thing with up and down. So I do not want to hit any left or right inputs. That is, that is pretty good. So let's try for diagonals. So I'm going to go from down, and then I'm going to hit some diagonals along the way. Just, just to see where my movement changes from up and down to left and right. Okay, so up, down. So I'm going to 
hold up and I'm gonna go rock a little bit, just a little bit. And I hold down, I rock a little bit. Hold up and I'll rock a little bit. And I'll hold. Great, that's fine. Because the Legend of Zelda doesn't have actual diagonal movements, but you could still input diagonals, so it's a good test to see if you are holding a diagonal if you accidentally hit the right and left exclusively. Thanks for sticking till the end of the video. If you want more gaming peripheral reviews, please let me know in the comments what you would like to see. Thank you and see you in the next video.